In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, Amen. Last night's Mass, or the Vigil Mass, which was actually this morning, was concerning the fact that God is always eternally not producing, but begetting His Son. There never was a moment that God the Father was not con considering His one thought, his all-encompassing thought, which is his word, capital W. And that's what begets, or that's what generates the sun. So, S-O-N, sun. So last night we heard, um, the Lord said unto my Lord, this day have I begotten thee. One of the most memorable introits of the whole year. This morning, earlier on, we had the second Mass, which was the generation or the, uh, the birth of Christ, the second person of the Blessed Trinity, in time. So we heard all about the shepherds coming to adore our Lord, our Divine Lord, the baby in the manger. And now we have the third Mass, which is our Lord being born in a soul. But he has, as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, who are born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. These words are all about the second person of the blessed Trinity, who is not only generated through all eternity by his Father, and he was not only put into this world in order to redeem us, but he is born in souls. And that's us. That's what we meditate this morning. He's born in souls. There are two reasons that we want to venerate this baby Jesus. The first one is that he's the perfect man. He did and he does what all men should do. God created Adam and Eve, and he added onto them something which they never deserved. He gave them the sanctifying life, or the sanctifying grace. They didn't do anything to deserve that, but God had added that onto them. It belongs to a man to walk, and to hold things with his hands in such a way that no other animal can do. And it belongs to a man to think. It belongs to a man to desire things in a spiritual way. These are our godlike qualities. This makes us in the image and likeness of God. And that's what puts us above all the other creatures. You could have one man and you could have an elephant is what, about 10 or 20 times as heavy as a man, and that man can work out something in his mind whereby he can dominate that creature. We're, bu we're above everything else, and that's not, even our God that's not even our state of sanctifying grace yet. That's just our God-like quality to be in the image and likeness of God, to think and to will. But as we know, Adam and Eve forfeited that state of sanctifying grace and it put man back to the level of only the natural, only this world, no more heaven. 4,000 years passes, and of course we have the patriarchs. We have uh, Noah and Abraham and Moses, Joseph of the Old Testament. We have all these holy men who did a very good job as men, but not as good as the Son of God himself, the incarnate word. The incarnate word is the perfect man, not only because he's also God, but when he was born, and this is from your catechism, God gave him a name, God gave him a body, and God gave him a soul. And those are creatures. 
We don't often say that because we don't want to get into some sort of heresy of changing God into only a man. But we say that in the divine praises of the, what do you call it, the, the benediction of blessed sacrament, blessed be Jesus Christ, true God and true man. He has a body and a soul, and those are creatures. We have a body and soul, and we are creatures. But the difference is, our Lord took that creature, that human body, and that human soul, and he never did anything which was all about me. He never did anything which excluded the presence of God. So, you know, uh, we have our temptation towards laziness and anger and curiosity and envy and, and uh, sometimes great things are proposed to us to make a sacrifice of some sort in order to help our neighbor and we refuse it because it just seems a little bit too big for us at the time. Well, we are men and women, but we're not perfect men because in different ways we are not conforming our will to the will of God. We are not being faithful to our supernatural state that God has lifted us up to by our baptism. Our divine Lord, on the other hand, never had one moment, and I'm talking about our Lord as human, human body, human soul. He never had one moment of saying, I'm going to reject this grace of God. I'm going to reject this opportunity at more holiness. I'm going to reject this, um, uh, uh, this opportunity to practice a little bit of sacrifice in order to make God live in my soul. And it was rough on the child Jesus and the adolescent and the man Jesus. He deserved to be a king, but he lived in total poverty. He knew better than any other human being what was to be done, and he obeyed his two human parents. He practiced charity towards his neighbor, and a lot of times he wasn't even thanked for it. And eventually we know what did happen. He tried to give the truth to his own people, the leaders of his own people. And as the same last gospel, just so we call it last gospel, the same text of St. John just told us, his own received him not. He gave them the truth time after time, and they said, no, we're not interested. We don't want to follow some humble Galilean carpenter who keeps showing us up. That is to say, you keep winning all the people, and your um, way of speaking is against all of our maxims and platitudes, etc. He was not received by his own people. But all, in all of that, whether it's the poverty or the obedience or the rejection or the, finally the condemnation by his own people, our Lord was constantly doing what his Father wanted him to do. And that's what would happen to us if we were perfect men or women. We would be um, constantly fulfilling our purpose. But you see, since we get a little defensive about our own rights and that person can't treat me like that and why does God have to insist that I do this or that or uh, we have our jealousy and our anger and our envy like I was saying. Since we get like that, so, so um, you know, self-focused, there's all kinds of fulfillment of the life of grace and the life of God that we never do. So we never become perfect men or perfect women. We never um, fulfill our purpose in life, in general. Huh? The saints get pretty close. But in general, that's our problem. Our Lord did not have that problem. Let's say, our Lord constantly sacrificed himself in order to fulfill this will of his Father. So he became, over and over and over again, the perfect man, what man was supposed to be. Certainly not like Adam and Eve, who renounced it, and certainly not like a lot of people that even belong to the church, who are constantly, yes, living in a state of grace, but making shortcuts here, making shortcuts there, doing things to fulfill their own purpose, their own self-interests, etc., and, and not really renouncing God, but let's say um, serving God short of how he should be served. So our Lord has that. He's the perfect man. 
And, well, we want to be that way too. We want to someday get to our particular judgment and say, I've done everything I could to live to God rather than live to this world or live to myself. And we might say, but how can we do that? We're so full of weakness. Not even just weakness, but actually malice sometimes. I positively desire to do something which I know is against God. So how can I go to the particular judgment someday and say that? And I answer you that our Lord has done it already. Next point. We are incorporated into our Lord by our baptism. It's just a matter of us kind of hanging on to our blessed Lord who has done everything that a perfect man is supposed to do and God at the particular judgment will see us as some kind of um, shadow or accessory to our Lord Jesus Christ himself will be there in our Lord we just have to hang on to him Our sanctification is in our Lord. We don't have to do it by ourselves. He has already done it. He is the firstborn of every creature, not just in the natural way, but also in the supernatural way. Just hang on to our Lord. He's, he's, he's uh, blazed the trail. He's walked the path. He's tread the wine press. Now it's our turn just to hang on to him. And that's what sanctifies us. And that's what makes us men not born of blood, nor of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. To as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Just receive our Lord, so to speak, means let him dominate your life. And uh, that's what's going to make you supernatural men and give you heaven. And now we come into the second part or the other part of this sermon and this lesson of this morning, which is how can you resist the baby Jesus, you know? For one thing, he's the perfect man. You want to hold on to him in order to, in order to be born of God, not of man. And the other reason you want to hold on to him is that how can you resist him? Uh, we have a young man up here serving Mass who's now the proud brother of three younger siblings. And I went to uh, visit the family in the hospital a couple days ago, and he was holding his new little baby brother with a big smile and sort of showing me that this is not the first time he's been able to do this. Um, who can resist a little baby, you know? Uh, that's the word made flesh, and he becomes like that. So when we consider uh, our Blessed Mother, Mother Mary, St. Joseph, in the stable or the cave with the newborn child Jesus, the newborn incarnate God, they have no doubt who he is. But scripture tells us that they pondered these things in their heart, well, especially the Mother of God, pondered this in her heart. And you can Im imagine that St. Joseph did the same thing. She has no doubt. She has, but beyond faith, she has certainty. This is God. This is the Son of God. But he or it is a little helpless baby. She has no doubt. But he's a little helpless baby. And where are the great kings of this world to adore him? They're not there. Eventually the Magi will come. They don't even belong to his own people. They're pagans and Gentiles. But his own people, well, we all know what happens. King Herod seeks to kill him because this boy is a threat to his own power. What nonsense. Uh, and worse than nonsense, what treachery. But um, the point is, they have this huge supernatural truth right before them. This is God. This is the Son of God. He's a baby. He's a helpless human baby. And they have no doubt that he's God. And who's left to adore him? Uh, humble shepherds who sometimes are not even the most honest of men in their own way. You know, they, key, they carry around uh, cheese and milk or whatever, and sometimes they steal from each other, and hopefully they don't steal each other's sheep from each other, but who knows? Maybe that's just called sharing in the wealth. Those are the ones who come to adore our Lord. These simple, 
um, country bumpkins, I say, in, in American. These simple men come to adore him because they have purity of heart. If someone, imagine someone like Herod had come to adore our Lord, as he once said he would, he said to the Magi, tell me about this child so that I can go and adore him too, which is pure deception. But imagine Herod did go to adore the child Jesus. He would have gone there out of human interest. I have to adore him because he's the king. If I don't adore him, I'll lose my power. I have to adore him because if I don't recognize him, um, I won't be able to climb up higher. It would have been some human self-interested thing which has nothing to do with adoring God. So who's left for adoring God? These humble, uneducated shepherds who are not even recognized by the world as our Lord himself is not recognized by the world. And again, when the shepherds came, the scripture will tell us um, Mary pondered these things in her heart. How could it be that this child who is God has no one but shepherds to adore him? So these are the two points. The first one is our Lord has become the perfect man by doing everything he was supposed to do as man. Next thing is this divine person, our Lord, started out as a human helpless babe and the only ones left to adore him are the rejected people of this world. So taking these two truths, on one side we say, we have to connect to our blessed Lord if we wish to be sanctified because he's already done it. It's just a matter of holding on to him ever since the moment of our baptism by receiving grace, receiving sacraments, learning about our Lord, practicing sacrifice, practicing faithfulness to duty with all the sacrifice connected to that. Just hold on to our Lord. And the next part is, how can we not hold on to our Lord? He comes to us in this irresistible presentation or this irresistible form of a baby whom no one can reject, whom no one in his normal human senses can reject. Take these two things. We need our Lord. We can't be sanctified without him. But even after that, our Lord says, don't worry. Even if you don't think about that, here I am as a baby. Are you going to turn me down now? And the answer is no, obviously not. So on both sides, we win. Our Lord presents himself to us. Hold on to me. You'll be sanctified. And the other way, he says, here I am. I'm a baby. How can you say no to me? These are mysteries of the nativity. These are mysteries of Christmas. We need our Lord Jesus Christ. And there's absolutely no one that will say, I don't want him. Because he comes in a form which is irresistible. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.